Hello, my name is Marcus and this is Motion Graphics and Cheese. This is an introduction not only to After Effects and its individual components, but also to how commercials work and how movies work, so that you can better understand why settings are the way they are, so that you can modify them with confidence. This here is the Project Manager. This is where you will see every single asset you take in from outside sources or that After Effects itself will create. So let's start by just pulling in some assets from this folder. So now you can see now we have three assets. We have an image, we have a movie, we have a piece of audio. To make anything in After Effects, you need a composition. And there are several ways to create a new composition. You can see here, you can either just click on the button, new composition, and this window will pop up with all the different settings. So the composition name could be whatever you want to call it. So here under presets, you can see a lot of the different presets that are being used on television and movies around the world. Now, this may seem intimidating, but don't worry. The primary preset that you'll need is HDTV 108025. This is one of the most standard presets in Europe and Asia. So it's full HD, if you've probably heard that term before, and that just dictates the amount of pixels it has in width and the amount of pixels it has in height. So you may also have heard of NTSC and PAL because these are standard systems in US and in Europe and Asia. So US uses NTSC generally and Europe and Asia uses PAL generally speaking. There's also of course Ultra HD and all these that you've probably heard of before but in actuality most movies and commercials still run on just 2K or full HD resolution. You can lock the aspect ratio so that even if you change this to let's say 2500, it will maintain its same ratio from height to width, respectively. So now let's take a look at pixel aspect ratio. So most digital things always run in square pixels because it's based on screens where every single pixel is uniformly square. A lot of these aspect ratios are based on how cameras would shoot things or how different TV screens would uh, present the, the pixels. So they would either be stretched or they would be squashed. We use, for example, anamorphic lenses in movies to make it look really cinematic. It, it's actually a footage that's being squashed first when it's being shot, and when we take it into a piece of software, we're de-squashing it, so it becomes two to one aspect ratio, and that's what creates that nice anamorphic look. But mostly we'll just have a square pixel because that is the digital format nowadays. So now we can look at frame rate. You can see there's a lot of presets here as well. Generally speaking, everything on TV in both Europe and Asia is running at 25 frames per second. Now movies and cinemas usually run at 24 frames per second. In the US, they can still have 23.976, which again sounds really weird, but it's because some of the old system ran what's called drop frame frame rates. And that's due to technical limitations or the way that uh, certain technical things of uh, TV screens and recording equipment worked. And modern day uh, US also runs in 29.97. So I'm just going to choose 25, which is the default here in Europe. This is just a preview setting. If you decrease the resolution, you'll get a faster preview, but it will of course be lower quality. The starting time code is usually only relevant with movies. And it's mostly when you're actually setting things up or when you're coordinating with others, like in uh, lock and loaders or uh, editors where it's best that it actually starts at one so that you have the pre-roll to make sure that people know that this is the first frame of the film. Now this doesn't really pertain usually to commercials or anything else. And this here's the duration. So this is always counts in seconds. So you can see these last numbers, they are frames. These two are seconds. These are minutes. These are hours. So most of the time in commercials, we usually just work in seconds, right? And it's usually not that long. So it's, let's say, 30 or 20 seconds. That's usually like the standard of a commercial. The background color is also just for display, is to make it easier for you to see what is happening on screen. So you can change this at any time. So let's just say, let's just call this test. Let's press OK. 
Now, you may see that there are some extra tabs up here, like advanced. Some of these settings only pertain to motion blur. When something moves really fast, it starts to blur in the direction it's moving. So you can actually, in here, you can change the settings of how sensitive After Effects motion blur is. The 3D renderer. The classic 3D render is what you will be using 99% of the time because that is what After Effects primarily uses to display anything. But it can also use the Cinema 4D to render some Cinema 4D scenes or to create some basic 3D objects in After Effects. So let's just press OK. So now we have a composition. As you can see, it's completely black. But that doesn't mean it is a black frame. If you go down here, you can see this toggle transparency grid. If you click on this, whenever you see this checkboard in After Effects, it means that it is completely invisible. This will not be displayed if you spit out something from After Effects. So one, we toggle that off, so it's mostly just to make sure that we can see things properly. We can select something and bring it down here into the composition. Now you can see the image image is here in our screen. Now you can see there's a little uh, time uh, line that uh, appears, so you can see the duration of your entire timeline and how much is divided up. You can see one second, two seconds. You can move the time indicator around to see what is happening at different points in your composition. See, right now nothing's happening because you've just taken a static image and placed it down. Nothing's happening. But if you take, for example, a movie down into your timeline, you can see by scrubbing the timeline, or moving the time indicator, you can see that things actually happen. And you can even, by clicking on the layer, you can move it around, so you can change the timing of when it appears. So this is very useful. So the timeline here also can seem a little bit intimidating with all these small knobs and stuff like this. If you play it around with Photoshop, you may recognize some of these things, like the blending mode. This is how a layer behaves with layers below it. So if you set this to, for example, add, you can see it actually merges a little bit with the layer below it. And we have the track mat here, which means that it will take the alpha of the image above or the luminance of the image above and mask itself out based on that. So let's take the movie underneath the logo and let's set it to alpha mat. See, now the, ver the top layer becomes invisible by default because it's not supposed to be visible. It's supposed to mask out the layer below it. So if we go over to the movie, you can now see the movie is only displaying within the bounds of the layer above it. If we actually activate this layer, you can see that is the only thing it's displaying. So if we move the logo around on top, you can see it's almost like a window looking into the movie below it. This can be extremely useful for both motion graphics or something artistic or abstract or even what's called compositing when you're making visual effects and you want to mask out let's say a tree in front of a person. I can see there's a bunch of icons up here as well. See if you hover over something in After Effects it will eventually tell you what it is. So the first one is a mini flowchart for the compositions but this is only relevant when you have more than one composition. So if you have more than one, you can actually see them connect to each other, so you can quickly select them. I can show you this real quick. If I double, if I duplicate this test comp, put it into this existing comp, and now I click on the flowchart. You can see I can now go into the comp below, or I can go into the comp above. So it's just a quick way to cycle between compositions. Now you have this one, you can hide layers. Now this is very useful. If we go down here to toggle switches and modes, you can see this little hide icon here. So if you start to have a lot of layers in your composition, let me just show you by duplicating this quite a few times. If I select all these layers and click on the little hidey person, you can see it hides. Then if I click on this overarching hide icon up here, they all temporarily disappear. It's a nice way to keep your composition nice and clean and have a complete overview without being overwhelmed. So frame blending is a particular case. So let's say you have a movie with very slow frame rate. So let's just take this movie here and time stretch it, which means that even though I'm moving through the frames, you can see three, four, five. So four of these frames are exactly the same. So it's only generating new frames every 
three or four frames. So if we wanted to create frames between those actual frames where things change, we could use frame blending by going down here and clicking on the frame blending icon on the movie. Now you can see every single frame that I'm moving through actually changes. So that is the cool thing about frame blending. It actually creates frames between frames if there isn't enough. If you click once where it just has this little bit of a movie clip, it creates frames based on the frames before and after where it just blends them on top. But if you click again and you get this dots to dots icon, you can see it actually generates some new information that we can see here. Now, right now it's not that pretty because we're stretching it much further than it's able to do it. But the cool thing is you can still use this for effects or other interesting things. And in some cases it works really well. This one here is to activate motion blur, which will blur an object if it's moving really fast in the scene. So if we go down here, I'll make a very quick animation so just to show you. Click on the position, go forward a little bit, move it really, really fast. You can actually make the first keyframe a lot further back. Something like this. So see now, if I also activate motion blur on the layer, you can see it actually blurs in the direction it is moving. The last icon here is the graph editor. Now, right now, it doesn't have absolutely anything because this only shows you information that is keyframed or animated. So if you go into a layer and you click on the stopwatch on, let's say, position, now there's actually some information. It is showing you the X value or the horizontal value. Or, and the Y value or the vertical value. So if we just go over here and we change the keyframe on the layer or the position on the layer, you can see it's displaying the value change over time. You can make animation curves that give you a lot more control over an animation and make it a lot smoother. So this is your composition window. So right ha right here, you will it will show you everything that is in your composition currently at this point in time. And down here, you have a bunch of icons. So see here, this is just useful in terms of do you want to zoom in or out of your composition. You can set it to fit your screen so that it fills the entire window. You can always change the size by clicking on the edges of windows. So this one here changes the resolution of your composition. So this is just preview. So see, once I change it to a quarter, it became considerably worse resolution, but it will also show you changes in your composition a lot faster. This is useful for when you have a lot of effects or a lot of stuff going on and your composition starts to render slowly. This little icon here is for fast preview. So this is also to change how fast you can see something change or not. So when you set it to adaptive resolution, it would automatically change between different resolutions to work as quickly as it can and give you feedback as quickly as it can. Wireframe is just to show you the bounds of each layer. So as you can see, it shows basically almost nothing. But if you have a lot of layers, you at least can see the bounding box of each layer. This one here is to show you the transparency in your image. These checker boxes indicate that there is no information in the image, which means that this will render out invisible. This icon will toggle the visibility of masks in your layer. So let's click on a layer here. Let's just go up here and create a mask on it. You will see, you can not only see things that are within your mask, but you can also see the actual edge of the mask. So if you click on that icon, you can see the actual edge of the mask disappears. But this is just for preview purposes. So now it's still there. The only difference is you can't see it. So maybe it doesn't bother you as much while you're working. Down here, we have region of interest. You can define an area that you want to preview and it won't preview anything outside of that area. So over here, you have different types of grids. Now, these are extremely useful. You can have a stereotypical grid, you know, standard grid, where you can just, it's easier for you to measure things up. You can have, you can have rulers, so you can pull down your own guide so that it's easier for you to align things, which is also extremely useful. And even more useful, you have title and action save. Now, this is very relevant when creating commercials. 
On TV, you can't always guarantee that each TV will display things the exact same way. So, as a general rule, everything outside of this last line is something that we don't expect everyone to be able to see. So let's say we actually added some text here. I'm going up to the text tool here. I'm going to say, hello. This piece of text, if you want to make sure that everyone can read it, it should be within the bounds of the first line. Once it's the second line, it more pertains to graphics. Graphics can come all the way out to this line and we wouldn't be that word because it's not essential information. But once you're beyond that line, you can usually not guarantee that everyone will see it, simply due to how TVs work and uh, some TVs are zoomed in or some channels are more zoomed in or don't have the same resolution. The reason why there's two additional lines within the primary one is due to different type of old TVs. Like in old TVs, this would be the 4-3 dimension. So at that point, you couldn't take anything beyond this little square here because then people wouldn't see it. Nowadays, most people in modern countries have widescreen, so it would be all the way out here until the edge. And there's the proportional grid. Again, this is just useful if you want to split things up symmetrically. Now over here we have different channels. So digital media works in channels, which means you've probably heard RGB before or red, green, blue, which is the colors we use to create any color on a digital screen. So if you press red, this is the amount of information that you can find in the red channel. Now you can go to green, this is the amount of information that is green channel, and of course blue, the amount of information that is in the blue channel. And together they create this image. So to actually show you that this creates an image, I've actually isolated each color channel in this logo. So you can see this is just the red channel, and we have the green channel, and we have the blue channel. But when I add them all together, they create the exact same logo you've seen before. I'm just telling each layer to add its information to the layer below it. So now we also have alpha channel. So alpha channel is what we call the transparency channel. When you toggle the transparency button again, you can see it matches up with what we see in the alpha channel. So here we have the exposure button. That could be very useful just to see what is going on. You can see you can make it very bright or very dark. So this logo was extremely blurred and we weren't quite sure if it was going outside of the composition, we would be able to in increase exposure and see that, whoops, yes it does, and then fix it. This little camera here is very useful as well. If we go over to the movie here, we can take a picture and then go over to another part of the movie and then click on this little eye here to look back at that picture we took. We can use this as a reference or maybe there's some colors we want to make sure that we're matching or any other stuff like that. Now here we can just see what the current point in time is, but you can see the exact same information down here. This also shows you what point in time you're at. So up here we have a lot of the basic tools of After Effects. Under File you can import a bunch of things, you can save the project, you can link to other Adobe features, you can even clean up your project by deleting assets that you don't need, or collecting entire projects so that you don't have to manually find all the files that you've used in your project. You can also use scripts which are extremely useful. They're like small tools that that automates stuff for you. So you, for example, can collectively uh, see find and replace text. So throughout your composition or throughout your entire project, you can find and replace a piece of text. And as you can see, there's a lot of different type of scripts. So it basically adds more functionality to your entire project. You can have project settings. This is also useful to look at. It can show you everything from how it displays time or how media is, is the start time of media, the color space that you're working in. This is more relevant for advanced stuff where you're switching between uh, color uh, spaces. Uh, audio, you can even change the kilohertz and what sort of expression engine that After Effects is running on. In Edit, you have everything you expect of Edit. You can duplicate things, split layers, you can have templates, you can change your preferences. In Composition, you can also change composition settings, as you can see here. You can even change it to be virtual reality or pre-render things. 
There's a lot of things you can do. So let's look here at layers. Layers are the backbone of After Effects. Everything in After Effects works in layers. So if you look here, there's a lot of different layers that we can play around with. So let's just click on the first one, text here. And that now you just see a line in the middle of the screen. So now I can just write, hello. And now you have a piece, a layer with a piece of text. And if you look over here on the right side, you can see character, where you can change the type of text, you can change the, if it's bold or medium or whatever you want. So you can increase the size, you can do all manner of things with the text layer. So let's just delete that. Next we have a solid. Solids are completely opaque layers that have a solid color. That's probably called, why it's called solids. You can change their dimensions, their units, all that stuff. Let's just call this solid. Press OK. So now we have a completely opaque image just with that one solid color. But the cool thing about the solids is that you can modify them, you can apply mass to them, you can animate them, you can apply... You can do all manner of things with them. So let's go up here into effects. Let's go down here to transition and apply a card wipe. See now, just with that one effect, it, it's changing the look of the solid. So if you go up here into the effect controls, which is where you will be modifying the settings of any effect you have on a layer. So see now, just by changing this value, we're changing the look of the layer. And that's how every single effect and every single layer works. Next layer would be a light. So lights are only relevant if you're doing something in 3D or if you have an effect that registers lights. So right now you can have different types of lights. We can have spotlights, a point light, which is just one point in space emitting light into every direction. Parallel lights are like spotlights, but from very, very far away. So it's an infinite light pointing in one direction. Ambient lights are just very mild lights that lighten everything in the scene and they can cast shadows and have fall off and all manner of stuff. So let's just see, already now it's giving me a warning telling me that there's nothing in this composition that is 3D, so nothing is going to register this light. But if I make a new solid, for example, and I make this solid 3D, now all of a sudden this light and the solid is reacting to each other. I can move the light in 3D space and see I'm lighting up that solid. Next we have the camera. So there's a bunch of settings in the camera as well. To adjust these settings, it's best that you learn how cameras actually work so that you can better change these settings and know what they actually do. So right now, let's just say it's fine with these settings. So once we have the camera, you can actually go into the position and go in and out of 3D space. So let's just delete the light here. Let's just take this light solid, duplicate it, control D, and I'm gonna move it in 3D space. So I'm gonna take it and move it, I'm gonna move it behind the other layer. Now with this camera, see if I'm moving the camera left, we can actually peek around the layers, as you can see here. Now next is the null object. The function of a null object is not obvious the first time you put it into scene. As you can see, it's just a layer doing absolutely nothing. It's not even rendering anything to the screen. But the null objects is basically a control layer. You can attach other layers to the null object. You can apply effects to the null object that control other layers. You can modify, you can animate the null object and have other objects follow it as well. So if I make a new opt a new solid, and now I pick whip, I parent the solid to the null object. And now if I move the null object around, the layer will follow that null object. That's also the cool thing about parenting. You can actually parent layers to each other so that they follow that layer's movement. Then we have a shape layer. So this is not necessarily obvious either. So once you create a shape layer, it will automatically select the mask tool so that you can create a shape. Now these shapes have a lot of functionality that is not obvious. So if you look down here in the content, you can see it has all manner of settings. It is filling the object with a certain color that we can change. We can change the stroke or the outline of the object as well. You can actually change the shape of the mask as well. 
And what is even more impressive is that all of this, every single shape is vectorized, which means that regardless of how much you scale up this object, it is not going to lose resolution because it is being created in After Effects on the fly. As you can see, I'm scaling this up a lot and it is still completely crisp. What's even cooler about shape layers is that up here in the top under content, if you press this little arrow, you can see all manner of different things you can apply to it. It can either be stuff where you apply different looks to it, or you can even apply things that change its behavior like twist. And if you go down here to twist and increase the angle, you can see exactly actually twisting the shape of this layer. And you can really create some interesting animations and shapes doing this. Next we have the adjustment layer. If you know anything about Photoshop, you will know what an adjustment layer does. Now let's see, if you create a new layer, a new solid here, give it a red color, okay? Place it under the adjustment layer, nothing is happening. But if we apply an effect to the adjustment layer, like color correction, let's say hue and saturation, we can actually change the hue of the layers underneath the adjustment layer. So if we hide the adjustment layer, you see the red solid layer is completely clean again. If we activate the adjustment layer, you can see the effects being applied once again. So this is very useful if you want to apply an effect to a lot of layers at once. Next we have Content Aware Fill Layer. Now this is also a lot like Photoshop. So once you click on it, you'll see on the right side here, a little panel will appear called Content Aware Fill. So as you can see, it's actually detecting a hole in our image, which has absolutely no value, no information. So it will fill out this part of the image as best as it can by replicating everything around it. And now we can see here how it's done a pretty darn good job of filling that little hole there. So next layer is the Photoshop file. Now this is quite cool as well. You can actually just immediately create a Photoshop layer, let's say test, and then it will automatically import it and open up Photoshop so you can start editing it. It's kind of nice. And last but not least, we have the Maxon Cinema 4D file. Now this is also quite awesome. You can either create a new one from scratch, as you can see here, or you can actually also import Cinema 4D files into After Effects to either take tracking information or basic 3D information, and even you can even render some basic stuff from After Effects from a 3D file. Next up we have effects, as you can see here. They'll pertain to different type of things, everything from 3D information to changing audio to maybe blurring or adding distortion. This is just a matter of experimentation. You can play with them and see how you can combine them to create something new. One of the awesome things about After Effects, you can just keep adding effects on top of each other. And you can also access them quickly over here at effects and presets. So let's just apply a bunch of effects like fractal noise, which is one of my favorites by far. So see now we can just play around with these settings up here and change the look of this noise, but you cannot keep applying more effects. Let's say a hue and saturation. Let's apply that effect, pull it all the way from here to over there, or you can double click and it will automatically apply it. You can press colorize and give it a bunch of color down here. And maybe now you want to add some glow. You just apply a glow and bam, I also got some glowing noise down here. You can decrease the brightness, stuff like that. So this is just a matter of experimentation. You can just play to your heart's content and see what you find, what you like. That's the cool thing about After Effects. You can keep stacking things on top of things seemingly endlessly to create new looks and new effects. So next is animation here, and animation is also pretty darn awesome. There's everything from you being able to tracking things, to warp stabilizing things, to actually save animation presets. You can select all the effects of your layer by pressing Ctrl A, go up to animation and save animation preset. So you can save this as a file, and then in the future, you can just 
go up here and apply animation presets and it will apply all the exact same effects with all the exact same settings that you saved them in. On the view we have a lot of the same things you actually saw in the composition viewport. So it's a lot of, uh, you can show guides and rules, change the resolution, zoom in. So under view you can also say new viewer and depending on what you have selected you can have more than one of each view. So if I select composition, click on view, new viewer, now you can have two open at once. And this way you can easily either reference things or see how some things will change once you apply the rest of the effects you have in another composition, so that's very useful. Next up is window. Now window is also a big bag of tricks. So you have a bunch of windows that you can activate and show in your project. So for example, essential graphics, see this will open up this little function here so you can add or subtract all these different windows that do different things everything from align graphics in your screen to tracking things in your screen to to custom windows or scripts that you purchased or made yourself and then insert them into your project as well so now let's look at this toolbar here so up here we have there's these three icons here are only pertinent to the camera. So if you had a 3D camera, you could use these three to navigate the camera around. The hand tool is just to move your screen around, but you're not actually moving the graphics. Zoom is to, of course, zoom in. And if you hold Control, uh, sorry, if you hold Alt you, and click, you zoom out. You can add the rotation tool. So you can basically just rotate the layer immediately without clicking on anything else. This is the pan behind or anchor tool. So if you move this around, you can see I'm actually moving this little bit of a point in the middle and this point dictates where the image is rotating from and scaling from. So this is also very useful. Then we have the mask tool. So as you've seen before, you can mask something out. And if you hold your mouse over, you can see the different type of masks that you can create in After Effects, such as this. You have the pen tool if you want to create your own custom mask, such as this. And if you hold down, you can see you have different ways of controlling that mask tool as well, which is nice. You have the text tool that you saw before. So the brush tool you can't just use on in your composition. You have to double click and go into the layer itself. So now if you click on the brush tool, you can see there's a little brush that appears on the screen. You can paint stuff in After Effects and as you can see, it will start on the frame that you painted and stay for as long as you want it. So you can actually frame by frame paint in After Effects if you wanted to. You can use the roto brush in here, for example, and just select some stuff here and it will roto this part out for you. If you go back into the composition, you can see the roto brush it actually masked out part of the image. Next up is the clone stamp tool. You might recognize from Photoshop. I'll click on the point that you want to recreate somewhere else and then you just paint and it starts to clone that part of the image. You have the eraser tool, but this is only relevant for the paint tool and the roto brush. And now one of the great tools of After Effects, the puppet tool. So this is really awesome. See, if you create points in an image, as I'm doing now, I'm just clicking on the screen. See, if I move these points around, it's actually warping the image on that point. So this is great for character animation or if you want to do something really organic and you want it to mesh around like this. And you can see it actually adds it as an effect in your effect panel. So you can refine how, uh, how high the resolution is and stuff like that. And this takes me to the last part of the video where let's say we're satisfied with whatever animation we've made. Now we want to actually spit this video out we want to create a video of this. So you can either go up into composition, add to render queue or press control M. And now it will take you over to the render queue and show you this is the job it's about to do. So render settings just shows you what the quality of the render you're about to spit out are. Generally, you're not going to be touching these settings except for maybe resolution, because a lot of these are just defaults where it keeps everything activated as you have it in the project. Then we have the output module settings. Now, these are very relevant depending on what it is you're supposed to export. 
QuickTime is one of the most widely used because it has high quality and you can still uh, ensure that it doesn't fill too much uh, too large a size. You could also spit them out as individual images if you wanted to, like uh, Photoshop or PNG or uh, probably JPEG somewhere. There you go, JPEG. There's also some other video formats, but I will still generally recommend that you keep to QuickTime. And within QuickTime, you can change even more settings. Again, I would suggest that you actually research these if you want to understand what the differences are. Generally speaking, 422HQ is one of the better ones because it's still very high quality, but it doesn't take too much space. But if you wanted to render something with, for example, alpha channel or transparency, you would need at least 4444, which guarantees that the fourth channel also has transparency. Transparency. Depth refers to color depth, so it can go all the way from 256 colors, which is quite old school, all the way up to floating points, which is extremely high degree of information in each uh, pixel or in each, yeah, in each part of the image. Color, pre-multiplied straight is mostly if you want to do with, do something with it later on, like compositing and stuff like that. Audio output, you usually just have it on auto, so it will register if you have audio in your scene, it will render it. If you don't, it won't. You can resize it and crop it in here as well, but that's to your own device. So now you just choose an output or where you want to render it, and you just press render. And once it's done, it will a file would appear. So I really hope that you found this useful and you found that you actually understand some of the things and concepts in After Effects better and about commercials as well. Have a cheesy day.